how simulations on supercomputers accelerate progress. Michael Resch, High Performance Computing Center, Universität Stuttgart. When the war came down, I had just come back from a trip to Czechoslovakia and Hungary, having spent time with young people discussing the future of their countries. Thank you very much for still being here and listening to me, and I have to say this is going to be the hardest presentation I ever had to do. Speaking right after you is not easy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'll not come anywhere close to you. Uh, what I'll try to do is I'll try to explain a few things and show you a few movies that relate to most of the things that were presented today. Most of the things that were presented today had to do with simulation, and many of the things that were presented today had to do with supercomputers. I would like to thank uh, Karl-Heinz Meyer for explaining to you what simulation means. He said that the human brain is able to do prediction, to sort of extrapolate, and that's exactly what we are doing when we do simulations. Could I have my slides, please? Come on, give me some slides, thank you. Um, what you do when you do predictions is first you resort to logic. You logically make conclusions. You don't do this on purpose usually. You start to learn this as a kid and then gradually you learn that there is a formal procedure and uh, it was sort of formalized 2,500 years ago and I only mention Socrates here not because he invented logic because, but rather because his dialogues are very interesting to read. Uh, about 2,000 years, logic was the main means of science until experimentation kicked in, and that's the second part of what you do when you predict anything. You use your experience. And using logic and experience, you're able to predict a lot of things, but not all of them. Some of them are simply too complex for your brain to be described, and you end up with mathematical equations which you cannot solve. And one of the guys who started to solve these equations was David Hilbert, a German mathematician who is mainly known to the people who study mathematics and know the Hilbert spaces and things like that. Uh, not very nice to read if you're not an expert in math, so please don't try it. Uh, David Hilbert did not have a supercomputer at hand because at the time a computer was a person doing calculations. And to give you a rough idea of what a supercomputer is, you have heard what a flop is. Add two numbers, multiply two numbers. Now the two simple numbers you can do in a few seconds. If it's a 10-digit number or two 10-digit numbers, it may take a minute. And to understand the speed of a supercomputer, you have to do the following calculation. Let's assume that all eight billion people living in the world would spend eight hours a day doing calculations like this. It would take them 36 years every child, everyone in the world, it would take them 36 years to do the same number of calculations that the most fastest system in the world is doing today in one second. So this is to explain what a supercomputer can do for you. Once you have a supercomputer, you can do a lot of things. Most people think that supercomputers are there for research, but I'm very happy to have seen a lot of presentations that already emphasized the importance of simulation for the economy, for the society, and for politics. And in the following, I'll use some of the questions that we got as a supercomputing center from people in the streets of Stuttgart, and I'll show a few movies that show how we can answer these questions. First question, how do we react in an aging society to the fact that more and more people get old? Well, what is going to happen if you get older? You have heard the human brain sort of gets worse. It doesn't work as well anymore as it did like 20 years ago. I can feel it myself. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it so happens. There are other things, very, very simple things. Your bones start to get more porous. They break more easily. Your arteries are either congested or dilatated. We call this an aneurysm if it's dilatated, uh, we, you suffer from a stroke if your artery gets too narrow. In this movie what you see is first a simulation of a broken femoral neck. What is interesting for us is the behavior of this bone under stress. Stress means that you walk, 
you walk upstairs, you go downstairs, you jump, you run, whatever you do. You can do a simulation of this and you can do a simulation of the repair work of the surgeon. If you can convince the surgeon that this is useful, which is difficult because surgeons work on statistical information, not on technical engineering information, you can improve the quality of the medical treatment. The second example is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. 2% of the people older than 60 years suffer from an abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's a bulge in your abdominal aorta. Uh, it may burst if it grows too big. Albert Einstein did me the favor to die of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, he refused treatment because treatment is uh, pretty tricky and there is a certain death rate for treatment. What you can do with simulation is you scan the patient, you take the data, you start to analyze what's going to happen in your abdominal aortic aneurysm and you probably are able to understand whether it will burst or it will not burst, which is good for you. Second, we have heard how we can treat diseases. Uh, one of the problems is to understand how you put together medicines and you see a simulation here of, molecul of mo molecules. This is done on a supercomputer. We are not very close to being able to design drugs, but we may be close to that in 10 years from now. And this is about enzymes and protein folding. We are able to do microseconds, but not seconds, and these are the ones that are important. Second question, what will happen if we are 16 billion people? The first answer is about 80% of us will live in cities. This will be the case not only for Western Europe and the US, but for most countries. Well, the biggest concern is our climate. And simulating the climate is extremely tricky because it's a large-scale system, which is in itself difficult. And second, we cannot do any experiments to validate our models. We cannot try to find out whether our models are correct. It took roughly three months to do this simulation, which is a one-year simulation of the Earth climate, and you see some of the turbulence across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it'll take us another 15 or 20 years or so before we will be able to do this, but then we will get a much better understanding of the climate. So what's the problem with climate? It's mainly CO2. Where does CO2 come from? Mainly from energy and uh, mobility. One of the questions we got is, and that's Germany, why don't we do more to shut down atomic power plants much faster? As a result of Fukushima, Germany decided to get out of atomic power. Given the discussions about oil supply, about gas supply from Russia, oil supply from the Arabic states, we try to be independent, but we will have to rely on certain technologies. And I'll show one example where we can use supercomputers for two years now to actually improve the situation. This is a coal-firing power plant. You can hardly do any experiments because you cannot shut down New York because you're testing the power plants. But you can do simulations here. And what you're trying to achieve is you try to achieve an optimized combustion process. An optimized combustion process which is economically relevant because you reduce the amount of coal you need and at the same time, you reduce CO2, and as a collateral, you also reduce SOx and NOx. The older ones of us still know what this is. Everyone else thinks that CO2 is the only bad thing in the world. So what you can do here is you simulate it. Now, if you go to sustainable energy, energy supply, one of the problems is that people would like to have it, but they don't want to have it where they live. And this is a water power plant. Uh, close to Stuttgart, north of the Black Forest. And what we did here is, together with ENBW, we simulated, first of all, the technology. That's a water turbine. That's easy, straightforward. Models are very good, 99% accurate, not a problem. The second thing we did is, we invited all the people living in this area into our virtual reality environment. And we showed them exactly what is going to happen there. And the most important for thing for them, which was most exciting for them, is we gave them a view of the power plant from the window of their living room. So everyone could come to us and say, this is where I live. We would look at the map and we'd say, okay, this is what it looks like. And if I go outside into my garden, okay, this is what it looks like. If I go shopping, this is what it looks like. It's very convincing. Supercomputing and visualization is a technology 
that can help politicians to convince people that some things are not as bad as they might look in the first place. Final question. One of the reasons why we are worried about the climate is mobility. Everybody wants to be mobile, but C CO2 emissions are rather high. And the question is, how can we make electric cars as reliable as today's cars? That was one of the questions of the people living in Stuttgart. Their main concern being, will I ever get a Mercedes or a Porsche that is, has no CO2 emissions but is as reliable as the cars that we have today? Now, this is a tricky question, and I can't, can't show any movies because they're all confidential. What I can show you on the left-hand side is something which I find very interesting. While politicians and technology leaders are discussing how we can reduce fuel consumption by twisting and tweaking the engines and the gearbox and everything, the key indicator for fuel consumption is the driver. You can use a Mercedes E-Class 350 CCI and you can go at something like 12 liters for 100 kilometers. Or you can drive that same car with a fuel consumption that is in the range of 6.5 liters per kilometer, roughly half of it. And that doesn't mean that you have to drive slowly. It just means that you have to drive clever. And this is what, this is what you can learn. This is a digital mock-up, and it's used by Mercedes and by Porsche to see how they can influence the driver to use the car in a perfect way to reduce fuel consumption, because that's the way to go. On the right-hand side, you see something which is sort of an outlook. Every supercomputer is available to everyone in this room here after roughly 20, 25 years. So this here used to be a supercomputer in the year 1986. The price was roughly 30, 50 million Deutschmark, somewhere in between, and it triggered a crisis, a political crisis in the state of Baden-Württemberg because Prime Minister Lothar Speth signed a contract to buy that system. Can anyone imagine that Lothar Speth or any other Prime Minister would get into a political crisis if I buy this device for the University of Stuttgart? So after 25 years, roughly, you will have a supercomputer at your hands. And this is one example of how you can use this. In Mercedes, we figured that there is a, a wall, in a sense, between the craftspeople working sort of in the trenches and the engineers working on a second floor. Actually, the casting factory in Mettingen is designed like this on the ground floor. You have all the craftspeople working with their models and everything, and on the second floor you have all the engineers. What we did is we integrated the visualization and simulation with the actual part. So what the guy standing there is doing, he's wearing glasses where we feed in the simulation results, and he can at the same time see the part on which he's working. And now these people start to believe they believe in simulation, they can use simulation to improve their work, and this, I think, is very important because you can improve the quality of the work, but you don't replace people. You empower them. So, is the world going to be all digital in the future? Can we simulate everything? Cities, global economics, pandemics, and so on. Can we simulate everything? Sometimes, it looks like this is possible. But I would like to leave you with this here. What is going to happen among people who, as it is said, do not direct their deeds to natural laws cannot be calculated. This was said by an Austrian author, Peter Handke, in 1965. He didn't think about computers at the time. But keep this in mind, wherever the human being comes in, the computer is going to be deadly wrong. And when I say deadly, I point at the Love Parade incident a few years ago in Germany, it was simulated whether the parade is safe, and the computer said it is safe. And with this, I thank you, and if you have any questions, see me outside. Thank you very much. Thanks for not coming up to the stage.